Hello, everyone, and welcome to the very first Patreon post. This is going to go through measures 1 through 27 in depth of my single piano version of the Rachmaninoff Third Concerto. Um, as you can see in the PDF uh, or the Muse score file, I've done a lot to try to make this more understandable, uh, adding in things like these asterisks, which are color coded and help to provide information for the piece. I plan on going through the entire thing this way. That's one reason I'm not releasing the entire file as it is right now, because I'm much further along in the piece. I'm probably uh, about 70% done with the first movement, but it's not all edited this cleanly. And I wanna make sure that I'm providing the most value uh, with things like finger suggestions, being really as true to the text as I can. And then these uh, parenthetical notations and explanations, which I'm hoping will help make this a lot easier. So let's get right into this, starting with measure one. Of course, this is marked Allegro Man Antanto, but I'm going to be going through this slower than that, just to explain all these concepts. So one of the important things that you want to make sure here is that you're hearing this bassoon line um, along with So you hear the connection between the left and the right hand. Don't feel like you need to follow all of these fingerings. These are the fingerings I find that work best for my hand. I'll, I'll explain a lot of why I pick certain fingerings, but uh, for those of you, especially those of you with even smaller hands, things like this might not work. Three, four, five. I choose this because it, I find it particularly easy to make a legato line. But if you cannot reach this, you can do uh, 5, 4, 5, or even 5, 5, 5 if you have to. Now here, this is something that I've chosen to do um, because I cannot reach all of these notes. I can't reach this in the left hand. I can reach it in the right hand. And I choose to do that because I would rather do that than roll the chord. Of course, if you have smaller hands, you'll have to roll the chord. In the blue, you see these notes may be taken in the right hand. I do this because I find it easier to keep that line going. Rachmaninoff writes a piano again there in measure seven, and I try to make it somewhat noticeable. Leading up to the piano, I wanna make sure there's enough of a little drop off. Now this part, I need a little bit of work on practice wise. The, the stretch is right at the limit of what I can reach in my hand. Some may have to roll. Again, that same thing here to avoid the roll if you can. So you can see another place here where I, I choose to play the right hand. The reason I keep it on that lower staff, I'm trying to make this as visually uncluttered as I can, which is very difficult when there are this many voices going on. So if I were to keep shifting them uh, from the bass clef to the treble clef or from the lower stave to the upper stave, it would be uh, hard to track what's going on in a musical line. So. Uh, that's why I'm using the color coding instead. There, I cannot reach this, so I choose to play the D up an octave rather than roll. You know, here, 
I find it easy to slide the three finger from the black to the white. This is kind of a controversial take. Some piano professors will say that you should never do something like this. It's used very commonly in jazz, but in classical, um, you run the risk of losing the control. So you could, you could um, use a four here, but I don't know. I just find it easy to do the three. It's not written in. Personally, I'm doing a bit of a crescendo from 14 to 15 and then dropping back down in 16. This little uh, mark I put here, this is not part of the melody, so the temptation might be to play too much of that, but it's it's really connected to this as part of the supporting harmony. So make sure this is not played too much. A little bit of an individual take in 18, the way I do this fingering. It could easily be done a number of ways. You could do five, four, five. I just find it a little awkward with the movement. The other thing I like about this fingering, um, it kind of forces me to stay a little bit longer on the C before I go to the B flat. And since there's a retardando and a diminuendo there, um, I find this fingering helps with the musicality of the phrase. In measure 20, I've taken the liberty to extend that diminuendo all the way to the end of the measure. In the piano part, uh, the piano is only doing this. So he stops the diminuendo at the end of that D. But in this single piano version, it's still going, so I, f I find it effective musically. To carry that diminuendo all the way to the end. And then that sets up kind of a subito mezzo forte at 21. Again, this is not part of the main melody. Measures 23, 24, 25, 26. Uh, just make sure that that melody is staying above. So there's a lot going on um, in the middle voice, but you you have these two voices at the outer edges. that's still the main content. So make sure that that can be heard above everything else. Now, because this is so heavily annotated with all of these colors, with all of this fingering, I personally, when I am working on new pieces, I hate reading through uh, music that is too heavily annotated. That's one of the things, like I mentioned, the Alfred edition uh, that kind of bugs me a little bit. It's not that I don't like and appreciate the work of the editing, but I feel like it can somewhat hamper my own creativity and imagination in how to approach a piece. So the way that I plan to circumvent that is to release two different versions. One that is more bare or urtext and truer to the original form without all the fingering suggestions and without all the annotations. And then uh, alongside of it, have this version kind of like uh, an appendix. So um, if someone's working on it and is struggling with a certain section, they can flip to the version that's uh, heavily annotated and maybe choose to use some of these, maybe choose to ignore them. Um, again, the goal being to provide as much value as possible here.